we've been doing this uh, year-long series of, of lectures and seminars and reflections uh, on the topic of marriage and family, and we used this book, Christian Marriage, a Historical Study, edited by Glenn Olson, um, as our sort of guiding principle to carry us through the various understandings of marriage in, in the history of the Christian, uh, Christian world, because understandings of it um, have changed, not in terms of its, of, of its essential fundamental meaning, but how we deal with it, how we uh, institutionalize it, how we regulate it. So that, for example, in the early church, um, there were no marriage ceremonies held at all that were specifically Christian. Uh, you, you had a, um, two Roman citizens married, and if they were Christians, um, they were married, quote-unquote, in the Lord, by virtue of the fact that they were uh, Christians. But there was no additional ceremony that, that one had to go through in order to be married as a Christian. You were already a Christian, you got married, and you were then married Christians. And uh, with time, it came to be the practice that the bishop would uh, give a special blessing to those who had become married. Um, but the church early on uh, came to understand that the essence of marriage was to be seen in, in the exchange of vows between the man and the woman. Um, even, before the, um, even before the church defined marriage as one of the seven sacraments, one of the specific means of grace that God had instituted uh, for our salvation, um, even before then, marriage was seen as providing an opportunity for God's grace to work in our lives. And the ministers of this religious act were seen as not a sacred minister, not an ordained person, but the man and the woman. The man and the woman were the ministers uh, of this religious rite. And then when it came to be understood as a sacrament, they were the ministers of the sacrament, and that's, that's true even to our own day. Um, all the other sacraments within the church uh, are administered by someone who is ordained, and they are administered um, for the sake of those to whom the, the priest does it for the sake of, of those who receive the sacraments. In, in marriage, it's the, uh, the husband and wife who become the means of grace uh, for one another within this sacrament. I know that's sometimes a little difficult to believe, but, <laughs> but that, that's one of the, the things that makes uh, marriage such an interesting and such a difficult sacrament as well, because uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not only a natural institution in that the most fundamental natural species in the world pair up male and female. Okay? Um, they may have multiple uh, partners, but nonetheless, it's always a partnering between, uh, between male and female. I think it was you know, Woody Allen in one of his movies is, is going through Central Park one time uh, t- talking to a girlfriend and, and bemoaning the, the instability of, of relationships in the modern world. And uh, he rather wistfully says, uh, the only ones who mate for life anymore are Canada geese and Catholics. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that about Canada geese. <laughs> but, <laughs> But nonetheless, I mean, they do. I mean, you, you see that within the natural order that there's a pairing between male and female for the sake of engendering uh, offspring and, and preserving the species. So marriage um, is to be found in the most natural order of things. But among human beings in society, obviously, it had to be regulated and it had to be institutionalized. And, and so every society had some means of regulating and institutionalizing this relationship between a man and a woman. And, and it could vary exceedingly between one society and another. The one constant, of course, was that it was between a man and a woman uh, for purposes of engendering children. I mean, that was the one constant. But whether or not the, the betrothal, when, when uh, the, the husband-to-be committed himself uh, to the woman he wanted to marry, and she committed herself to him, um, whether or not that became the point at which marriage was considered uh, uh, established, or whether it was three months later when they would actually go through a marriage ceremony and finally consummate in the marriage, those kinds of things there have, have seen a great deal of variety 
um, in, in the history of the world. But it's interesting, in, in Roman practice and law, uh, when a man and a woman would marry before uh, a Roman priest, uh, the, the priest would say to um, the woman, it wouldn't be exchange of vows such as we have, uh, take this man to be your lawfully wedded uh, husband or vice versa wife. Uh, the Roman priest would turn to the woman and say, are you prepared to become a mother? And he would turn to the husband or the man to husband to be and say, are you prepared to become a father? So I mean, it's very clear within Roman law that there, there was this essential link between the establishment of this legal institution of marriage and the generation of children and the establishment of a family. So as I say, these were merely picked up by the church in the societies in which the early Christians found themselves. They didn't modify them. Uh, people still married according to the, uh, the legalities of the society which in, within which they found themselves. But as I say, then it, it, it developed so that uh, there would be blessings bestowed by the bishop. Then people began to seek uh, these blessings. They wanted the, the exchange of vows to take place within the Eucharistic assembly, which is how the Christians gathered um, every Sunday. But it was still seen as being an associate, I mean, uh, the ministers of the sacrament were still seen as being the man and the woman. Now, this was so embedded in, in Catholic thinking um, that it, it did create some problems because there uh, began the practice of clandestine marriages where a man would commit himself to the woman uh, and she would commit herself to him. They were the ministers of the sacrament. Uh, they would consummate the marriage and then he would find interests elsewhere and, and leave the poor woman uh, unable to, to attest to the, uh, the validity of what had taken place. Um, so the, the church was faced with a real problem here because the church constantly, constantly condemned clandestine marriages because they said they should take place within the community, they should, they should be publicly witnessed. But since the man and the woman in Catholic theology were the, were the ministers of the sacrament, the ones that forged the bond and, and bestowed grace upon one another, that was settled uh, teaching in the Catholic Church. How were they going to be able to address this, uh, this problem of clandestine marriages? And uh, you've all heard of the Council of Trent, which was convened to deal with the Protestant uh, movement and also to bring about reforms <clears throat> within the, the Roman Catholic Church. One of the major issues that they had to grapple with at, that, at the Council of Trent wasn't the denial on the part of Protestants of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. One of the biggest problems they grappled with at the Council of Trent was the notion of clandestine marriages and, and how this was going to be uh, addressed. So the, um, there was a decree by its uh, Latin word that begins the decree, temetzi, um, that declared that even though the man and woman remained the ministers of the sacrament, uh, it had to take place in the presence of a priest. So they, they didn't modify the teaching, the theological teaching, but they, they added a condition uh, to the practice of the sacrament that hadn't been in, in place before. Uh, you all know the story of Romeo and Juliet, of course, and that is an example of the leftover practice of clandestine marriages, if you remember. Romeo and Juliet got themselves uh, married without benefit of the uh, knowledge of, of either family, you know, the blessings of the parents. And uh, it, it led to some grave problems in, in their cases, if, if you remember. So, again, my point here is that, that, that marriage is a thoroughly natural institution, even at the, at the base animal level, uh, that uh, it, it is... Um, a social institution, and by our belief, it is a sacrament that, that we as Catholics believe that God has taken this natural institution and uh, um, elevated it uh, to the, the, the status of a means of grace. None of the other seven sacraments were natural institutions prior to their having been instituted by Christ. So it really becomes rather difficult to make sure that all of these, uh, the, the natural elements, the, the, the social and legal elements, and the sacramental elements are all in place uh, to have a truly valid and, and sacramental marriage. So um, 
so there's been a development, there has been a development uh, in, in the regulation of marriage, but never has there been uh, any other understanding of marriage anywhere in the world until the last 20 years or so. <laughs> Duh, pardon me, can you clip that out of the tape? That, <laughs> that marriage could be anything other than a, than a lifelong union between a man and a woman for the sake of, of generating children and establishing a family. Uh, and you know, I don't want to get off on this, but it's one of the things we're grappling with now in contemporary society with regard to these quote unquote uh, gay marriages, which are just nonsensical, uh, mindless. Uh, but it's, it's always those who oppose uh, quote unquote gay marriages are always accused of opposing them uh, from a religious belief. But not one single atheistic state, Marxist regime, uh, ever suggested that for the good of the of the social order that you could possibly have marriages between uh, individuals of the of the same sex. So it, you know these were even officially atheistic states that held to the same position that the rest of us do because they at least they could see reality for what it was. So um, while we're saying that there there have been developments in the understanding and regulation and uh, institutionalization of marriage, there really has not been uh, any change in understanding its, its basic essential properties. Uh, the, uh, the Bishop of Madison, uh, Wisconsin, Robert Morlino, who is also chairman of the board of the National Catholic Bioethics Center, told me when I saw him in February, he said, you, you know, he said, uh, well, they just faced uh, uh, the attempt to legalize, quote unquote, gay marriages in, in Wisconsin, and Bishop Morlino uh, taped a homily uh, against that law or referendum, whatever it was, and, and also against the proposal to, to fund uh, destructive embryonic uh, stem re, uh, research, um, embryonic stem cell research. But anyway, <laughs> Morlino, Bishop Morlino uh, taped this homily. He directed his priests to play it from the pulpit in all of the churches for the Sunday Masses prior to the election. And he said that he would not tolerate... Uh, any show of disapproval, verbal or otherwise, and it would be dire consequences if, if uh, that occurred, such as rolling of one's eyes when he pushed the button on the tape recorder, you know. And, um, so more, Bishop Molina was ready for all of that. But when I saw him in February, he was telling me about a conference he had had with his priests, and he said, look, he said, he said, fathers, he said, I can understand how you might have some difficulty with the dogma of the Blessed Trinity, you might have some difficulty explaining the relationship between the co-eternal Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, this is something that's profound and deep and, and difficult to, to grasp fully. And he said, and I, I can understand how you might have some difficulty grasping and explaining the hypostatic union, the incarnation, the way in which the, the second person of the Trinity uh, would become man, would be in the flesh. But marriage... I will tolerate no confusion or misunderstanding of marriage. How could there be? You know, this isn't something that's revealed. This is, this is something of the natural order. So Bishop Morlino is one of our great heroes, and uh, keep, your, keep your eyes on him as, uh, as he progresses in his career. Well, that's all of a bit of a prolegomena, which I extended a little bit longer than I would have because I saw people still coming up the stairs <laughs> before I, I got to the uh, essential points of, of this evening's uh, presentation, which, which is to look at the meaning of marriage. Um, I've already talked about that somewhat in terms of this very, very brief and, and cursory historical uh, overview. But there's been an attempt, uh, as we know, to redefine marriage in our own day um, for millennia, not millennia, for centuries. Um, the church used a very simple formula to describe marriage, to explain what marriage was. Okay? And, and very simply, it, it ran like this. It, it, and it was explained in terms of its ends, E-N-D-S, its ends or its purposes. Because, I mean, every, everything, we, we can understand everything in the world. This is a philosophical principle. You can understand what anything is by virtue of its end or its purpose. I mean, that's what defines it. What is this thing that I'm holding between my fingers? I, I plant it in the, in, in the, in the ground, and, and um, three, four years later, I've got a nice small oak tree. Okay, so we, we know what this is by virtue of that toward which it is 
ordered. Okay? Um, so a, a, a thing derives it, its, its very being, its, its very meaning, from the end for which it was created. That's how we understand what a thing is. There was a show, it wasn't on television very long, it was called The Liars Club. And they would have four celebrities and then they would have two contestants and the celebrities would be given some gadget and they had to tell what the gadget was and it was something no one had ever seen before. And the way they explained what the gadget was was to explain what it did. Okay, what its purposes were. And, and then the, uh, the contestants had to pick out which of the celebrities was lying because they would know ahead of time what the thing actually was. So this is, this is just a, a, a principle ingrained in our understanding of things. This understanding of reality is, is called teleological, teleological from, from the Greek word telos, T-E-L-O-S, which means end. Um, and we not only understand what a thing is by virtue of its end or purpose, we understand everything we do. We understand what our actions are by virtue of ends as well. So we can apply a teleological analysis also to human actions. So we, we don't know what a person is doing unless we know what they're, what they're directing their actions toward. For example, I could yesterday I walked out the front door of my house and somebody could say, what's Haas doing? And the answer could be, well, he's walking out the front door of his house. But does that really answer the question? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm taking the garbage out. You know, or my car has a flat tire. I'm going out to change the flat on my tire. Or as was the case yesterday, I was, I was going out the front door to catch a train to go down to Washington, D.C. Uh, for the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast, which was held this morning. So what's Haas doing? Well, he's on his way to Washington, D.C. for the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast. So we're defining what we do in terms of the end. That's the only way we can understand it. In fact, if people aren't acting for an end, for a purpose, uh, we don't treat them like normal people. If, if they're not acting purposefully for a purpose or an end, uh, we don't consider them to be engaged in, in human, if you will, you know, uh, moral behavior, behavior that we can judge to be either morally good or bad. You, you see a, you're, you're driving down uh, Lancaster and you see a, a young woman standing in the rain in November and, and you think, my goodness, even the animals know to get out of the rain. You know, what's she doing there? And, and you go, you do your errands, you're coming back, she's still standing there. So you pull your car on and, and you go, are you, are you all right, miss? Oh yeah, I'm fine. But you're standing here in the corner in the rain. Well, I'm waiting for a bus. Okay, so all of a sudden what looked like purposeless behavior, you know, looks like it makes some sense because it's done for an end. Oh, you have some place to go? Yes, I have to go down to the, to the mall. What are you going to the mall for? I have to go to the station or store to, to, to get some paper. And uh, for my computer. And, oh, are you in school? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in med school. Oh, well, why are you in med school? I want to be a doctor. Why do you want to be a doctor? Well, I want to help people stay healthy or cure them if they get sick. So all of a sudden, what looked like incomprehensible or, or, or uh, uh, unreasonable behavior makes sense in terms of the ends. Okay? You're, you're sitting at your kitchen table with your spouse. You see Mrs. McGillicuddy aimlessly wandering down the street in her house coat, and you turn to your spouse and you go, oh dear, there's Mrs. McGillicuddy again. The poor thing suffering from Alzheimer's. Fred probably doesn't realize she got out of the house, you know. And so what do you do? You get up from the breakfast table, you go out, you take her by the arm and say, Mildred, here, come with me, Mildred, and you take her back to her husband because she's not acting purposefully, okay? You wouldn't, you know, see Charlie Bruskovitz going down the, the, the main street inebriator, so you're not going to go out and try that with him, you know, <laughs> you know but, but poor Mrs. McGillicuddy, you can't, because we don't treat these people uh, who do not act purposefully uh, <clears throat> as, as acting in a fully human and intelligible way. So the church, understanding this, this reality, this, these principles of reality, defined marriage in terms of ends, ENDS, in terms of the purposes for which it existed. And, and the formula was the primary end of marriage is the procreation and education of children. The secondary end is mutual support and a remedy for concupiscence. Now that was an established formula that was used by the theologians 
It, you, it was used by the canon lawyers because if the canonists wanted to see whether or not you had a, a, a truly legally established marriage, you had to see whether or not the, the institution into which these people entered and, and the reasons for doing so matched the description. So, that for example, if it were determined, in canon law, for example, if it was determined that um, the husband, let's say, before they got married, had a firm resolve not to have children because he thought it would interfere with his professional career, and he wrote a letter to his best buddy and says, Charlotte doesn't realize this, but there's no way I'm going to have a kid. And, uh, and then he goes through the marriage ceremony in, in which he publicly uh, commits himself to having children. If it should be determined four or five years down the road, let's say through, through the appearance of this letter, that, that he had purposefully intended uh, to preclude, to act against one of the ends or purposes of marriage, the marriage is invalid. Okay, so, and, and that's what we call an annulment. The, the church would say there was no institution of marriage because as this man entered into it, he excluded, precluded uh, one of the ends or purposes for which the institution exists. It's what defines the institution. You take that out, you don't have uh, an institution. Now, real quick aside, yes, there are people who get married who cannot have children. That's another matter. There you're not setting the will against one of the ends or purposes of marriage. You're not dis- that because that's the only thing that constitutes a moral act is, is whether or not we, we exercise the will and make a decision. So if, if a couple is, winds up being infertile, um, that's what the philosophers say is being accidental to. It, it, they, they didn't intend that. Uh, they would want to have children. And even when, if, if you're, if, uh, uh, you know, two. 67-year-old uh, people get married, a widow and a widower. Um, they're not, obviously they can't have children. But they're not positive, as they enter into marriage, they're not positing an act of the will against one of the purposes and meanings of marriage. You know? It's just an accidental circumstance that at 67 you can't have kids anymore. You know? <laughs> but but you're, you're, it, it doesn't touch upon the essence and the purpose of what this institution is. So the, so the church had explained it in terms of the, uh, the primary end of marriage being the procreation and education of children, secondary and uh, mutual support, and a remedy for uh, concupiscence. Now, uh, there has been a concerted attempt to redefine marriage on the part of many in contemporary society. What's really dismaying is when you sometimes have theologians who want to try to redefine marriage. And um, if we look at the documents of the Second Vatican Council, or if we look at the encyclical that dealt with the regulation of births that was issued by Paul VI, uh, Pope Paul VI in 1968, called Humane Vitae, um, you don't find that encyclical, and you do not find the, uh, the, the portions of the conciliar documents uh, primarily Gaudium et Spes, uh, the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, uh, which has a section on marriage and family, you do not find either Paul VI or John Paul II or the Second Vatican Council using the language of primary and secondary ends. You don't. Uh, they, they use different language. And the language that uh, they use I have one, is uh, from... Um, oh, no, I hope I have it right here. But yes. Um, now see, there I go. I, th- I thought I was, I was smart and I put my train ticket in there so I could just turn to it. Anyway, <laughs> the council and Paul VI talk about the procreative and unitive significations or significances of marriage. Okay, The unitive and procreative. Um, the, um, rather than using the, the language of... Uh, of primary and secondary ends. Okay. Now, if you describe marriage in terms of its unitive and procreative meanings or significances, I think you can see that that rather incorporates the procreative and the, uh, the mutual support that was used there in the, in the older language. 
But so many of the theologians who wanted to repudiate the church's teaching on marriage and divorce, on contraception, on, on homosexuality, made the claim, made the charge that the church changed its teaching uh, in the Second Vatican Council. And if, if you wouldn't believe that they could actually make such, a, such an outrageous claim, I have just a few quotes here garnered from many of the books I've read by uh, dissenting theologians. Uh, one writes, Vatican II took a major step forward when it deliberately rejected the priority of the procreative over the unit of end of marriage, end quote, or another one. Vatican II, however, officially and explicitly rejected such a view that the purpose of sexuality is primarily procreative as incomplete and with good reason. Or again, the council's deliberate rejection of the centuries-long tradition that regarded the procreative end as supreme necessitates a thorough rewriting of the theology of marital sexuality found in the moral manuals. And I could go on, I could, because every, every dissenter claims that the teaching has changed. So what I, what I want to look at here for the next uh, 20 minutes or so is, is whether or not that charge is accurate and, and how the traditional understanding ought to be understood in terms of the language that the council used. So let me make a point, first of all, by saying that the Second Vatican Council was not a dogmatic council. It wasn't convened to deal with disputed doctrinal matters. They were all settled. I mean, the church didn't doubt that there was any doctrinal dispute that they had to grapple with uh, at the Second Vatican Council. They had, I mean, the First Vatican Council, probably the major doctrinal issue they had to deal with there was, was papal infallibility. Uh, the Council of Trent, they had to deal with the challenges uh, from the Protestant movement to our belief in the seven sacraments, the sacramentality of marriage, for example. But the Second Vatican Council was to deal with the pastoral issues that, that the church was facing in the modern world. So uh, to suggest that it would have... Uh, repudiated established doctrine just doesn't manifest an understanding of what the council was even convened to do. Um, it was a council, and John the Twenty Third, who called the council, um, and, and those who helped organize it, made it very clear that they, they wanted to find a way in which the church could more effectively communicate the saving truths of Jesus Christ and, and of our faith to the surrounding world, and that therefore they purposefully would try to avoid using technical language when they would explain the teachings of the church. And in some of the meetings that led up to the, uh, the writing of the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, pastoral constitution, that is, how is the church going to relate to the modern world, to the church in the modern world, right? Um, in some of the, the meetings leading up to that, uh, that dealt with the question of marriage and family, um, the pariti, the experts, were saying, look, we have to avoid technical language. We want to make this accessible to as many people as possible, the, the true beauty and richness and fullness of what God has given us um, in, in the sacrament of marriage. So a decision was made to avoid technical language. Well, let me just say that what I had given you earlier, the primary end of marriage is procreation and education of children. Secondary end is uh, mutual support and a remedy for concupiscence is technical language. It's language drawn from a particular philosophical discipline, the discipline of metaphysics. And metaphysics is the study of being as such. It's not making moral judgments. It, it's, 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 it's not to um, provide motivation for behavior. Metaphysics looks at reality and says, what is this? <laughs> and then it describes what this is in terms of ends, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of teleology. Now, the, admittedly, there are a number of reasons why people get married. And there, there's no question, I, 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 well... Actually, sometimes this isn't the case. But in most cases, uh, uh, a young man, a young woman, or an older man, a young, older, older man, younger woman, or older woman, young, a younger man, whatever, whatever the mix is, you know, they, they find themselves attracted to one another. Okay? There, there, there's some kind of an appeal uh, 
whether it's you know her sense of humor, whether it's her spunkiness, whether it's, it's her gorgeous good looks, you know, there's some kind of an initial attraction there. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the classical definition of love is the spontaneous movement of the will toward that which is good. I love that, you know. Um, love is the spontaneous movement of the will toward that which is good. So the man and the woman perceive something in the other that is good, that's attractive, that's appealing. Okay? And so you have the initial movement here of, of, of the will toward whatever it is that has been seen there as, as, as being good. And then as that attraction develops and people get to know one another better, you, you, uh, uh, you develop a friendship. And St. Thomas Aquinas said the basis of marriage is friendship. Okay? You, you be, I've, you've probably seen these knitted pillows you get in silly shops. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, uh, you know, my wife is my best friend or whatever, you know, things like that. Yeah, we know that. But anyway, the <laughs> but I mean, it expresses that truth. So you can even get them in needlepoint pillows in, 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 in shops. Uh, that the marriage is, is, is based on friendship. Um, and and this, is, this is what initially draws a couple together. You know, people will say to me, nine kids, you've got nine kids. Wow, I mean, you crazy? I mean, what you, you know, you know, the mar- you got married thinking you're going to have all those kids. No. I mean, I, I have to admit, before this assembly, and with my beautiful wife in the back, that, <laughs> that when I got married, children were the last thing on my mind. I mean, I, just, I wanted to spend the rest of my life with this absolutely beautiful, captivating uh, woman. You know, that, that's, what I, that's what I wanted. You know, that's what, that's what drew me into this relationship. Um, you know, the kids just kept coming along afterwards, you know. I mean... Uh, but that actually leads to the next point because, you know, people establish friendships with all kinds of other people. But there's one kind of friendship which is quite unique and distinctive, and that's the friendship with a member of the opposite sex that is itself, the friendship itself, is so deep, so rich, that the, the friendship can't be contained just between those two friends. It, it engenders another person. Okay? It, it's, it's, it's procreative. It, it, it's, 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 the good suffuses itself. Okay? And it's so good that it, it makes more of itself. You know? and, and so there, there's, there's an, an integral link between, between friendship and the, and the generation of children. Now, if you're going to do a metaphysical analysis of what I've just sort of described phenomenologically and say, well, what is the, the, the purpose, ultimately, of these two people coming together and engaging in a quite unique physical activity as well um, that, that seems to be focused just on, on, on pleasure and expression of love, but it, does that fully define it? No. We happen to know that that, that particular friendship and that particular activity, uh, uh, the, the conjugal embrace, um, is ordered toward something even, even further out, if you will. The child. The child. In the language of metaphysics, the primary end is merely that end or that purpose of an action which ultimately and in the final analysis and most thoroughly describes what that reality is. doesn't mean it's better. See, this is the other thing. People get all upset. <gasps> Primary in the marriage having kids and only secondary is having friends. No. I mean, I, I, th- I, sh- I tried to show you how uh, phenomenologically in terms of human experience the friendship comes first. But if you're going to do a scientific philosophical analysis in terms of metaphysics, the primary end is what ultimately describes what is going on here. And, you know, if, if I don't know, someone from another planet stumbled upon uh, a husband and wife in bed in the conjugal embrace, it could well be thoroughly confused as to what's going on there. You know, it, it, m- it might even look like it's hurtful behavior, you know, that they're hurting one another, or they're fighting or something, you know. He's, and he'll go, wow, how do I understand this? What sense can I make of this? Well, you make sense of this nine months down the road. 
you know, then we understand what this is really all about, okay? So, another point about, about metaphysics and, and uh, uh, the teleological analysis uh, within metaphysics is that the ends are inseparable. You can distinguish between the ends, but you cannot separate them because the, the ends are part of the same reality. So if you, if you get rid of one of the ends, one of the purposes that's describing what we're dealing with, you no longer have the same reality. You wind up having something else. Okay? So we can distinguish between the ends of marriage, but they are inseparable. Okay? So, um, so we're really talking here about the purposes or ends of marriage, and we see these purposes and ends as goods. That is, as, something, as things which are attractive, which draw us, the things, the, the possession of which fill us with joy, okay? make us feel fulfilled. Okay? Uh, that's why they're goods. Okay? And, um, and, and so we're really looking here at reasonable human behavior uh, that leads to personal happiness and individual uh, slash communal flourishing in terms of the embrace of the goods. My, my favorite quotation from St. Thomas Aquinas uh, with regard to the moral life is contained in his great work called the Summa Contra Gentilis. His most famous work is the Summa Theologica, the Summary of Theology. Uh, but he wrote a, a work called the Summa Contra Gentilis, in, in which he tried to explain um, the Christian faith to, uh, first of all, to, to those that did not share the Catholic faith. And, and so St. Thomas would explain the Catholic faith only by reference to Scripture rather than by referring to church documents because he knew he was dealing with people who didn't accept the Pope, for example. Uh, but then he also developed arguments to explain Catholic teaching to those who weren't even Christians, okay, the pagans. And so he would use natural reason. So in his uh, Contra Gentilis, Thomas refers to uh, the motivation for the moral life and, and says, and I always say, if, if, if I go out anywhere and I say, if, if you remember one line from anything I've said tonight, let it be this one, because it, it will completely reorient your approach to the moral life, most probably. Thomas said, God is offended by us. God is offended by us only when we act against, only when we act against what? Usually we get the answer, God is offended by us only when we act against his will, only when we act against his commandments, only when we act against his laws. Thomas doesn't say that. Thomas says God is offended by us only when we act against our own good. So it's not a matter of having laws imposed on us from above. It's a matter of God wanting us to flourish, wanting us to be happy, wanting us to embrace that which is good for our own benefit. God is offended by us only when we act against our own good. So if... if if there's ever a, um, a moral teaching of the church that creates some confusion in your mind, say, how could the church insist on this, or how could the church say that? Ask yourself, well, how is it that the church sees this particular activity as threatening to my own good? You know, God's not worried about himself. He's only worried about us. You know, our sin doesn't, uh, doesn't hurt God one bit. Okay, but it does a heck of a lot of damage to us. You know? and, and, and this is what he wants. It's interesting, John Paul II did not like to refer to the Ten Commandments as commandments. He would invariably refer to them as the Decalogue, which is Greek for the Ten Words. The Ten Words of Guidance. You want to be happy? You, know, you want to be fulfilled? This is the way to do it. You avoid these kinds of activities because it's just going to militate against your own good. Now, if, if we look at marriage... What are the goods on behalf of which we act? Naturally, they are the goods of human life. I've already talked about that. The 
procreative good that's just inherent within the activity itself. There is the, uh, the good of friendship that we talked about. Now, if we take the old metaphysical formulation, um, the primary end of marriage is the procreation and, and education of children. Okay? So, th- so that's the good of the child that's contained in marriage. And the secondary end is mutual support, and that's the good of friendship that I've been talking about, and a remedy for concupiscence. And I'll get to concupiscence in a minute. Um, I just want to say a, a couple quick words because of the, the, the pervasive misunderstanding of, of marriage and human sexuality in contemporary society. There is an intrinsic link that cannot be broken between sexual activity and children. Contemporary society wants to try to break that link. They do everything in their power to break that link. The federal government gives billions of dollars to Planned Parenthood to help them try to break that link, but it can't be broken. I mean, despite the fact that we have all these contraceptive methods, we we give billions of government money uh, to these kinds of programs. Uh, guess what? You know, we, we, have, we have close to a million and a half abortions in this country every year. We have close to 30% of our children now born out of wedlock. Okay. Try as you might, you're not ultimately going to be able to sever that inextricable link between the two. My wife and I knew a great, great uh, Catholic gentleman who was a convert from Judaism. He was a physician, Herbert Ratner. And he said to I remember hearing him say one time, uh, you'll never understand sex unless you realize it has to do with babies. Okay? Now that's, that's what we're talking about here, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and I remember in, in uh, Chicago in my old days uh, attending a whole week of lectures by a theologian, a Church of England theologian from, from Cambridge University, a whole week of lectures on human sexuality. And um, he never once mentioned children. And at the end of the week, I put up my hand and I said, Professor Pittenger, I said, um, you've been lecturing to us a whole week on human sexuality and about the way in which we have to be intimate and connected with one another in, in, in this depersonalized technological society. I said, but you never mentioned children. Oh, my good man. He says, you can't expect me to cover everything in a week. Everything? I mean, let's, let's get to the heart of the matter. I mean, you know, let's get to the essence of things. I mean, no, I don't expect you to cover everything, but how about that which is of the essence of, of, of sexual activity? A few years later, he published a book called Time for Consent, in which he argued for the morality of homosexual relationships. So, he was a homosexual. So, of course, uh, his understanding of sex didn't have to do with the engendering of, of, of life. Uh, and, and, and that kind of genital activity uh, is, is not life engendering, but it's death dealing. It's death, it's, it's only one or the other. <laughs> you know? It's going to be generative of life or it's going to engender death. That's it. Those are, you know, those are the choices God has put before us. Um, so, it, as I say, it should be self evident <laughs> in, in, in our day, but. but for some unknown reason, well, I know why, because there's been such fierce propaganda to the contrary. Uh, It isn't, but it really should be. And and, um, the interesting thing is that, well, many interesting things here, but I mean, one of the things is is that marriage is not so much the institutionalization of sex. It's not so much uh, providing a context uh, within sex, within which sex can take place. Marriage is really the institutionalization of the purpose of sex. And what's the purpose of sex? It's to have children, to generate children. And and you need an institution for the sake of the children, which will be engendered by that activity. I mean, why would the state try to regulate marriage through laws? Why? Why? Every state has, has, has laws regulating marriage. Why would the state be the least bit concerned about the random copulation of its citizens? Why? 
because that random copulation leads to certain things, which are children, okay? And if there is not in place a context, an institution, in which that good can be cared for and nurtured and gendered and educated uh, and, and prepared for citizenship, um, the burden is going to fall on whom? The rest of society. Right? Uh, the, and, and then the, the, also that good is not, tr- not treated as a true good because it's not given the proper context within which to receive what it needs to flourish as a good. Right? So the two, the two are linked. It, it's, it's interesting that uh, St. Thomas... Um, when, when uh, he, he writes about uh, marriage he, uh, he, uh, as, as, as being based upon friendship, uh, the commentator of Thomas, a, a priest by the name of, of uh, Walter Farrell, says uh, the following, it is to be noticed that children come under the head of compensation in Thomas's thought. Children come under the head of compensation, not of burdens of marriage. Okay? I mean, again, people find out we have nine kids. They go, oh my gosh. You know, I mean, how, how do you deal with all those liabilities? I said, what do you mean liabilities? I said, we've got nine profit centers, you know? I mean, <laughs> well, at, least, <laughs> well, at least don't I wish. But I mean, they can, <laughs> I mean, they go out, they sell newspapers, they babysit, you know, they get jobs. I mean, you know, it depends how you look at this. You know, what do you mean? burden. It's a, so it is to be noticed that children come under the head of compensation, not of burdens of marriage. For the child is a perfect expression of love. Here is a union that is an embodiment of the mother and the father. Okay, so the, the love of the mother and father becomes incarnated in the child. Here is a surrender. For he or she is a master of them both. Okay, now anybody who has kids and realizes you have to get up at you know, 2.30 in the morning to deal with a colicky baby. I mean, here's, here's one who is a master of them both, which is the child. The child is a consecration, for here is one that lifts them both to heroic heights of sacrifice. You know, that's, I mean, that's a beautiful presentation of, of what children bring to the bond between the man and the woman. Nothing so deepens the bond between uh, a husband and a wife as, as children. When I was uh, on my marriage day, uh, my father, who was always giving me good advice, he was a great man. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And, you know, it was always, uh, you know, you look a man in, in, in his eyes when you're talking to him, you know, or he'd see me shake somebody's hand and he'd say, hey, what kind of handshake did you give to Mr. Smith over there? It looked pretty wimpy to me. He said, you give a man a good handshake, you understand? So my dad was always giving me good advice. And, and uh, on our wedding day, he takes me aside, and he says, John, I just have one word of advice for me. And I said, please, Dad, not today. You know, <laughs> I didn't do any things on my mind, you know. I mean, you know, did the, did the best man really have the ring? You know, am I going to get the name right when we exchange our vows? You know, there are all kinds of things that you worry about, you know. <laughs> did we get the reservation made for the... For the night, and uh, uh, he said, "No, no." He said, "He said, just hear me out." He says, "Just one line." He said, "The greatest thing you can do for your children is to love their mother." And I said, "Okay, Dad, thanks." And I forgot all. I frankly, I forgot all about it. You know, <laughs> you know, I went on. I got married. You know, how those things happen, and. Uh, uh, I remember years later, after we had a number of procreative goods underfoot, that, uh, <laughs> that, that a certain dynamic uh, would occur with, with, within, the, within the family. And um, if, if my wife and I were having a rather animated discussion about finances, not fighting, just an animated discussion that maybe was getting a little tense and loud, that the kids you know, who might have been playing, having a good time, uh, would, would fall silent, you know, they'd tiptoe out of the room, they'd say, don't go upstairs, mom and dad are fighting, you know. Um, I would also find that if we would uh, be showing our love for one another, like one of the kids would catch us kissing in the kitchen while Marty was making dinner and, and they'd run through the house. I just saw mom and dad kissing, you know, and they would giggle, and then they were, they were happy. And, 
And, and my dad's words came back to me then. I, and I, it was years later. We said, the greatest thing you can do for your children is to love their mothers. This is, this is how these goods are so, so inextricably linked together. Okay. So the children are going to flourish as I'm showing and manifesting the love for my wife. I don't even have to be necessarily thinking. I'm, do, I'm not doing it. You know, you don't think I'm doing this for my kids. No, you think I love this woman. I'm doing this for her. And the children thereby flourish as a result. And I found that the reverse was true of this also, and that is the greatest thing you can do uh, for your wife uh, is to love your children. Because I would, uh, uh, my wife is never happier than when, when I'm attentive to the children, you know. So I mean, it's, 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 these are inseparable. And they're so inseparable that, it, as you know, John Paul II has taught us, and it's not new in, in the history of theology of the church, but he pulled it out and explicated it in ways that had not been done before, but that, that the life of a, of a man and woman in love um, reflects the life of the Blessed Trinity, where the, 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 the two persons become one, and out of the union of those two persons comes a third uh, person to that union. Okay, so that, as, as John Paul II used to like to say, um, a communion becomes a community. Okay, the communion, the union of one and two becomes a community of, of many. And, and, and then I want to uh, finish up, and I'm over, I promise. Can I go five more minutes? Okay, I mean, just walk out if I, if I can. <laughs> we started a little late. But no, I want to touch on concupiscence. Um, because that is also one of the ends of marriage, a remedy for concupiscence, remedium concupiscentiae, you know. Uh, and uh, how is this understood? Well, let me, let me just put a little uh, uh, explanation here first. You know, concupiscence refers to that, um, to a certain disorder of the passions. Now, the passions are good. God has given us the passions. He's given them to us for our good and for the good of, of, of the community. Um, but there can be a certain disordering of these passions, which is referred to as concupiscence. Now, Luther regarded concupiscence as being sinful itself. Now, everybody suffers from concupiscence. Um, and, and Luther held to the doctrine of the total depravity of man, and, and even uh, when we were justified and, and, and righteousness, righteousness was imputed to us, we, we didn't become righteous, but God counted us as righteous, uh, the sin of concupiscence remained. In the Catholic tradition, concupiscence itself is not a sin. However, it has arisen from sin, which was original sin, and it leads to sin. Okay, so it's a disorder that, that is, is in our very joints uh, be, because of the sin of our first parents and, and because of our own sinning. So we, we have to deal with it uh, carefully. Okay. Um, so marriage helps to uh, provide uh, an outlet for some of the tensions that can arise uh, from the passions as, as they become disordered and we live uh, in a world th that are filled uh, with temptations. And not only is, is this... Uh, not wrong, but it's, it's, uh, it's part of God's plan for us as his children, that there, there would be a way in which we would deal um, with, these, with these passions and even sometimes with the disorders which may arise from the, uh, from the passions. But, it, it's, but it, unfortunately, it too often becomes uh, identified uh, Merely with sexual tensions, you know, the buildup where, where people become sexually charged, they need release. And that's part of it, but that's far too narrow an understanding of, of what is meant uh, by a remedy for concupiscence. Because one of, the, one of the disordered passions for men in particular, you know, is, is that they, they're constantly out to conquer the world. You know, they're taking on this task, they're taking on that task, they have this country to conquer, they have this hill to climb, you know, they've, they've got this windmill to tilt against, you know. And uh, they're, they're you know, jousting with one another, and they're, I mean, you know, they're just hard to hold down, you know, and, uh, 
And frankly, men by themselves would not be very productive members of society. You know, they just, you know, they, they tend to be disordered and, and disruptive. And, and uh, so God has a remedy for that, and it's called woman. You know, it's, it's called a wife, right? And, and she helps to temper, okay, this, this disposition to, to, to go out and conquer the world. And, and the, the wife and the child has a way of rooting the, 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 the husband, the man, uh, in the family, okay, and for their good. Now, it's a very different thing for him to be willing to go out and spill his very life's blood for the sake of the homeland, for the sake of his wife and his children. A very different thing there than to be going out to conquer a new, new territory. When we're dealing about a remedy for concupiscence, I mean, there's a disorder there, but we're talking about God having made arrangements for his creation, which he made, talking about human beings here, as bodies. Now, we, we have this incredible gift in that we've got an immortal soul. We've got reason. We can reflect. We can, we can build skyscrapers. We can fly to the moon. We can, we can do logarithms. I mean, these are incredible things that we can do. But as we do them, we are always bodies, right? We, we always do them as bodies. And, and John Paul II had developed, um, again, just holding to the tradition, um, his theology of the body. You know, and, and he saw that one of the great dangers that we faced in contemporary society was a certain dualism, a certain split within, within the human person where the real person was seen as the spirit you know, or the individual's thinking. It didn't, you know, and, and what one did with one's body was a matter of indifference. Okay? Uh, so that whether you contracepted, whether you uh, committed adultery. I mean, it, it all would depend on the circumstances as to whether or not it was something you could justify. As long as you, as long as you wanted, to, as, this was a, this is always the line, you know. As long as what you were doing was loving, well, then you've you've totally spiritualized things. You know, you've got this, you've got this, this funny, disembodied notion of love. But what the church teaches us, what the scriptures teach us, what's so clearly revealed by God. It's that there's nothing disembodied about us. Our love is not disembodied. Our love is bodily. Right? Uh, just so much so that uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas in his Questionis uh, Disputate de Potentia Dei um, uh, tries to take us down the, the trail to a, a, a false understanding, and then he catches you at the end. But he says, we're called to be like God. And you say, well, yes. And he says... And God is a spirit. And you say, well, yes. And Thomas says, well, then the, the soul separated from the body must be more like God than the soul united to the body. And you go, well, yeah, that makes sense. And Thomas goes, no. He says, the nature of God is to be a spirit. Our nature, the nature of the soul, is to be united to the body. So the soul separated from the body is less perfect and therefore less like God than the soul united with the body. So we as Christians, now we say we die, the soul goes, we as Catholics believe either either to hell or to purgatory or right straight to heaven. Um, But that's not it, is it? I mean, we anticipate what? The resurrection of the body. Did somebody say that? I hope so. (laughs) <laughs> we anticipate the resurrection of the body, okay? So it ain't over till the body's been resurrected. And, and Thomas says at one point, um, he says, um, this is very interesting, he says, my soul may be in heaven, said non ego. My soul might be in heaven, but I am not. Because I am not in heaven until the resurrection of the body and the soul has been reunited to the body. Then I'm there in the perfection of everything that God wants for me. And it's very interesting, the Catholic priests will now celebrate Mass for various intentions, which is a wonderful and good thing. Now they will tend to say, uh, well, this, this Mass is offered for, or usually it's even, uh, let's remember in a special way, <laughs> uh, Mildred McGillicuddy, you know. And you think, well, why? I mean, is she, is she, is she having financial problems? Is she, uh, is she uh, going to uh, uh, take her driver's test? Is she facing exams? Um, no, she's dead. Um, 
what, what the priest used to say. What, and you have to remember, when she's dead, there's no more Mildred McGillicuddy. I mean, she isn't until the body's been resurrected. Okay? So the priest used to say, and some still do, who are a little bit more refined and have been my students, the, uh, <laughs> but the, the priest would always say, this mass is being offered for the repose of the soul of Mildred McGillicuddy. Okay. You see, these are little, little things, but, but they're so essential to maintaining the full truth of what it is that God has given us in our creation and in our recreation in Jesus Christ. So in the creation of us as bodies, he gave Adam Eve. And he declared, there is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Right? Wow. You know, that's, in the, that's in the natural created order. And then when it fell away and became disordered, uh, it was recreated and lifted up to an even higher station so that it became recreated as a sacrament, as a means of grace. And in the fifth chapter of Ephesians 22, St. Paul tells us to surrender ourselves to one another out of love for Christ, but give ourselves as a living bodily sacrifice. We give ourselves as our bodies. And he says that the husband is to love his bride as Christ loved the church, and the bride is to submit herself, subject herself to the husband as she would to the Lord. Now, how many preachers do you know who are afraid to even go near that? And yet it's the most beautiful expression of what it means to have this natural institution of marriage recreated in Jesus Christ so that it becomes a means of grace. And we cannot understand what those words of St. Paul mean unless we see them in Jesus Christ. You take it out of that context, they make no sense. Then it does become an oppressive kind of relationship. But Paul says that, that the husband is to love the wife as Christ loved the church and for whom he gave his life. So the husband has to be ready to surrender his life, his very life's blood for his wife. And when he's telling the wives to submit to the husbands, what he is saying is, wives, allow your husbands to serve you as Christ serves his church. Allow your husbands to give his sweat, to give his energy, to give the last drop of his life's blood for you. Allow him to do that. And so that's just a a brief overview of uh, the meaning of marriage as as, uh, contained solidly in what has been revealed to us in Scripture and, and in the teaching authority of the church. And I thank you for your attention.